Dear colleagues, welcome, welcome from wonderful Barcelona here at ESMO 2024. We had a chance to be here together with Professor Petros Grivas, not from Greece anymore. Petros, tell us where you're from now, where, where you work as a professor of oncology. Great to see you, Axel. I'm a professor at the University of Washington and the Fred Hatch Cancer Center in Seattle, the United States, Pacific Northwest, far away from Greece, but still close by. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I, I always tend to ask the people where they where they work. Uh, for, for example, with me, with my affiliation Schleswig-Holstein, well, I'm a urologist from Germany, northern Germany near Hamburg. And next year we host the ESMO in Berlin, so we will have a German tour. But now come back to 2024. Petros, I, I was impressed by your comment on the Niagara Falls, not the falls, but it was like a fall of new data we saw from Tom Powell's. It was a presidential presentation on perioperative treatment. I mean, I'm a urologist, you're a medical oncologist. Our chairs move even for nearer to each other. Close because to each of, other. Yeah, very close to each other. <laughs> Next so to each other. You, <laughs> could you summarize the data we saw and uh, what it has for your, uh, you, you know, I, I know you're leaving tomorrow also back to the US. How does it change how you treat the patients now? Thank you so much for your kind words, Axel. It was such a great time yesterday. Presidential symposium, a blood cancer trial in the presidential symposium of ESMO. So the Niagara trial that Professor Pauls presented so well was also published at the New England Journal of Medicine at the same time. So this is, a, my, in my opinion, a practice changing trial. The design is patients in the neoadjuvant setting who are cisplatin eligible, they, in the control arm, they got neoadjuvant gemcerapine and cisplatin. Four cycles, the standard of care that we have so far. And the experimental arm has the addition of durvalumab PDL1 inhibitor, mm -hmm. so Gemsys plus Durvalumab, four cycles. Durvalumab is given once every three weeks, four doses. Patients get un underwent radical cystectomy and pelvic lymph node dissection by a great urologist like you. And then there was an adjuvant therapy component, up to eight monthly doses of adjuvant Durvalumab yes. on the experimental arm. And the primary endpoint was pathological complete response rate, but more importantly, event-free survival a time to event endpoint. As a secondary endpoint, they also look at overall survival. The design included a neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy component of durvalumab, so it's very hard to tease apart what is the most important. Do we need neoadjuvant, adjuvant, or both? It was very interesting because we see the same design in other tumor types, breast cancer, lung cancer, and it's sometimes hard to know if we need both components of the therapy phases or not. In this case, what was the result? I know, like you said, four cycles of chemotherapy. Was it concomitant, durvalumab, uh, and then in one arm, more cycles afterwards? So it was perioperative treatment and also including the radical cystectomy, which I know in the future maybe we can avoid, but it's still like standard of care in the setting. So what was the result of this trial? And you're right, this trial was specifically for patients who underwent radical cystectomy. And the first message was that the addition of durvalumab concomitantly with neoadjuvant gemcis, these four neoadjuvant doses, did not compromise the ability of patients to undergo curative intent radical cystectomy. The toxicity profile was very similar in the two arms. Mm. So of course we have to be careful and educate our patients to report timely and accurately symptoms for immune-related adverse events. But if you look at the tornado plot, toxicity profile was very comparable between the two arms. That was reassuring to me. And the very similar proportion of patients, more than 80% in both groups underwent radical cystectomy. Yes. About 6% of patients, just 6% and 7% respectively, opted to not undergo cystectomy per patient preference, which raised the question, mm. in the future, can we think about more blood preservation approaches? But in the context of this trial, the it patients, was it, was, it was similar, and the, most patients went, under, uh, went radical cystectomy. The pathology complete response rate was 27% with neoadjuvant gemcis, 37% with gemcis durva, a 10% difference in the path CR8. The path CR8 sounds a little bit lower than expected, and I think the reason is in the denominator, they included this 6% of patients who selected to not undergo cystectomy. So that might explain the little bit lower than expected path CR8. So, so we really have exciting data, not only getting better event-free survival, also getting a better pathologic complete response. And uh, for us as surgeons, what, where we offer this uh, surgery to the patient, 
It also makes us confident that collaborating with medical oncologists or in countries where urologists give chemotherapy, it is safe to still operate. And this is, I think, also a good take home message of this trial. So I think this could potentially, when the regulatories approve this, for me, this would be the next standard. Definitely already new RD1 chemotherapy is the standard of treatment, including radical cystectomy. And now we have a PDL1 inhibitor, Duvalumab, showing a benefit. So very, very exciting. Um, questioning is we have um, in Europe and also in the US, you have the nivolumab adjuvant approval for you without the biomarker and I think for us with a biomarker positivity. So in this context of the new data, what, how, how would, you, would you cue in the treatment when you, when you uh, treat a patient with um, muscle invasive bladder cancer? That's a great question and to your point Axel, there was a significant event-free survival benefit with nivolumab in that particular Niagara trial, has a ratio 0 0.68 favoring the Durvalumab arm. Mm -hmm. And there was also an overall survival benefit that was surprising to me, has a ratio 0 0.75, yep. again favoring the Durvalumab arm. And this data come in the context of adjuvant checkpoint inhibitor monotherapy data, Checkmate to 74 trial that led to the regulatory approval of Nivolumab alone in the adjuvant setting in all comers in the US, PDL1 positive only in Europe. So the question is, what do you do in the context of all this? Personally, I think that the data from Niagara trial are compelling enough. So patients who are fit for cisplatin in the new adjuvant setting, I would offer them chemoimmunotherapy combination. And I think it, there are some theoretical compelling advancements uh, if you give, at least regions, if you give a new adjuvant immunotherapy because you have more neoadjuvants presence, you have an intact lymphatic system, mm -hmm. you do not need to recover from surgery. So some theoretical reasons why neoadjuvant may make sense. But of course, these are just hypotheses. The tangible data is that the neoadjuvant addition of Durvalumab prolonged event free overall survival. So I think this is important because in the adjuvant nivolumab per placebo, yes. we have a trend towards OS, but no conclusive overall survival benefit yet that we know of with the adjuvant nivolumab trial. So, but we have always benefit with Niagara. So I would go with the new adjuvant and then adjuvant approach. I would do this perioperative approach. In cisplatin ineligible patients who cannot get cisplatin, the Niagara trial data do not apply. So those patients may go to up for radical cystectomy or clinical trials, or some of those patients may go for bladder preservation if they are fit enough for that approach. So I think the Niagara data are compelling. We see what the regulatory agencies may say. Mm -hmm. And I think the other interesting thing to me is, do you need, again, new adjuvant, adjuvant, or both for now? Until we get more data from Niagara and other trials and subsets, I would go with this sandwich approach, the perioperative approach. And I would do both in fit patients, of course. Well, uh Exciting, and especially with these three adjuvant trials with iomonotherapy, help me, the ambassador was still there, and we had one negative, we have two negative trials. So we have the chance to have Professor Grievous here today, so let's think of a little bit difficult question. So once you have treated patients in the Niagara setting, and the patient recurs, let's say after half a year, so you had chemotherapy prior to surgery. I did the surgery, sent them back to you, you did... Um, how do you call it, continuous or switch maintenance, do a volume up treatment, and then a recurrence occurs, which can happen. We all, we all agree, the situation, aggressive disease and bladder cancer. So what's the next uh, treatment for metastatic disease? Is it EV Pembro, where you already had a PDL one inhibitor, or is it EV monotherapy, or is it platinum then? A rich challenge? Great question. It was one of my discussion points yesterday in one of my last slides. What do you do? if a patient who received neoadjuvant, adjuvant durvalumab had subsequent later recurrence of disease, metastatic setting, do you do pembro -EV? Can you re-challenge patients with checkpoint inhibitor? That's a very difficult question because those patients were excluded from EV302 and, and other immunotherapy trials. My personal take is I take into account multiple factors. The most important is when did the recurrence happen? If someone is progressing while receiving mm -hmm. checkpoint inhibitor, I think more likely than not, that patient may be immunotherapy refractory. So the mode of action change then? I think so. I may not re-challenge that patient, but if someone completes, let's say, adjuvant ruvalumab or adjuvant evolumab, depending on the yes. situation, and recurs later, you may ask me how later. That's a difficult question. Arbitrarily, I don't have any data. I would say six months or later, after the completion of the immunotherapy, 
I think it's reasonable to think about Pembury V in the context of the very impressive data with the combination, mm -hmm. but we really don't have that data to guide us. What is the treatment-free interval that may allow us to rechallenge patients with immunotherapy? And of course, the other question is, did the patient tolerate mm -hmm. the immunotherapy well, any significant immune-related adverse event? And just to make a very quick point on your great discussion, Axel, we talked about the Niagara, we talked about segment 7-4, we also have the ambassador trial data. Very quickly, adjuvant Pembro versus observation. We had disease-free survival benefit with adjuvant Pembro there, doubling of the median disease-free survival. We have no chain overall survival, mature analysis yet, but the paper was published again in the New England Journal of Medicine of the ambassador trial, Dr. Apollo. I was honored to be a co-author, and I think the question will be, whether the regulatory agencies, maybe the FDA, will or not approve adjuvant PEMBRO. So the, 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 there is complexity, but as I mentioned, Niagara trial, segment 274 and Ambassador have really changed the way we treat this disease, incorporating checkpoint inhibition earlier. And the big question is your, yours. What do you do later if the patient was pre-exposed? True. But, uh... Thanks for your insight and thanks for answering all our questions here. I mean, it's, we, we have multiple more, but due to the time right now, we, we are so grateful to have you here for some seconds or some minutes. And I think, I mean, in bladder cancer, we had seen so many exciting developments the last couple of years. Standing ovation last year, this year, again, some part of standing ovation. So great data and looking forward to keep eyes on this disease. And I think we can do a lot for our patients in the future. And thanks for time. And thank you for joining our discussion. Thank you.